We found that we could prevent two heart attacks or strokes for every 100 patients treated. One year ago, new cardiology guidelines suggested doctors stop targeting specific LDL levels because there was no good evidence one low level was better than another. Dr. Steve Nissen of the Cleveland Clinic believes those recommendations need to be changed immediately. This study really does blow up the guidelines. I mean, the guidelines didn't have target levels for LDL cholesterol. And many of us thought that was wrong. And now within a year of issuing the guidelines, we know that that's wrong. For years, doctors have been treating patients in a very specific manner with regard to heart attack prevention and the use of cholesterol medication. All that may change in this study. Good news for all. Welcome back to Midpoint for this week's House Call. Newsmax Deputy Health Editor Nick Tate, who actually is a man in the prime of his condition and would <laughs> never need a statin. How's that? <laughs> Not entirely true. Okay. <laughs> when, when he says this will blow things up, but come on. I'm one of those people who, again, we question things. Is sure. it really going to do that? For people who have had a heart attack, the answer is yes. Uh, if, you have, if, you have, if you're at risk for heart disease, the, the debate has been, will statins lower your risk of having a first heart attack? And that's still a matter of some debate. The evidence points one way or the other. But what this research looked at is individuals who've already had a heart attack, and in those cases, you absolutely benefit when those patients get very, very low levels of the bad cholesterol. The principal way to do that, you can do some things with diet and exercise, but the wait principal minute, way to do it is S drugs. Okay, well, okay <laughs> say the other D word again. Uh, diet, diet is key. Diet is key. And, and you know, that's, that's really the issue here. I think too much is made and has been made of cholesterol, and in fact, the guidelines that the doctor's referring to there tried to, to point out that there are other factors involved here as well. There's diet, there's exercise, there's your weight. But for those individuals who already had a heart attack, there's no question that get those, getting those cholesterol levels low does save lives, but you have to make it part of your whole lifestyle. People need to understand, I mean, with this, and I'm not trying to downplay what's happening here no. because it's great news, <clears throat> but people still need to understand that a drug, a statin, will not save your life by itself. That's right. You can't take a pill. Of, you can't medicalize a condition like this entirely. It has to be part of a lifestyle change. All right, and just in time for Thanksgiving now, yeah. now we have a new study out that says that <laughs> eating less will help you live longer. Let's not even get into what will happen on that Thursday. But again, <laughs> I, I hate to always go back to it. It's great to hear these studies. This, again, is common sense. It is common sense, but the, uh, the, the extra little uh, X factor here is what they, what they actually did with this research is they looked at why a low-calorie diet, why eating less helps you. It's not just that it keeps your weight down and doesn't contribute to obesity, Thanksgiving Day aside, um, <laughs> but it also affects the genes in your body. There's a, there are about 900 genes that are specifically tied to longevity, uh, heart disease, diseases of age, and what they found is that low-calorie diets are better for those genes. They don't activate them as much, they don't irritate them as much, and so that's, they are, uh, ex the science is explaining what we have known from a common sense point of view for a long time. And isn't the science basically still telling us that this does not mean that you must immediately go on some sort of a starvation diet. No. This is all, again, part of low calorie, moderation. Low-calorie, low low-carb diet, moderate diet. You know, and let's talk about Thanksgiving. One day a week, one day a year is not going to kill you to overindulge a little bit. Just don't do it every day. You haven't seen some of the people walking around Disney World, let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that another time. Yeah. Home cooking now. Let's get around to this. This is to, it's how your food is prepared. That's right. Because at, at my house, we're very cautious of how we prepare when it comes down to salt, sugar, and so many other things. Mm -hmm. And we watch what we buy. But again, it's how you prepare, again, that is all part of your health. This all ties in. The message of this study is eat at home. If you prepare your own food, you're going to use less fat, less processed foods, less salt. You're going to be more conscious, particularly if you're cooking for a family, of providing healthier, healthier meals. That's what this research showed. Be beyond the health benefits of eating at home and controlling your diet and not eating fast food and not eating processed foods that you can get dining out, they also found that people who tend to eat home six to seven days a week or even less, a few days a week, tend to eat better when they're out. They eat smaller portions. They make better choices in the menu. And, you know, the, you know it's kind of what, what's, what's the, the, the phrase, you know, uh, uh, charity begins at home. Well, health also begins at home when it comes to home cooking. So there's a lot to recommend it. You know, for my money, in my house, my family, my mom's a great cook, my wife's a great cook, it tastes better to eat at home. And not only that, let's face it, when you go out to a place and you order a plate of food and the plate of food comes out and it is this big and it is this high exactly. and it is loaded with cream, sugar, whatever, you should, it's again, 
just realize what you're eating, that's all. It's not the same thing, you're gonna get it home. Exactly, you can control portions, you can control what goes in, you can set it aside for later if you want, but it's all of those things. In, uh, the immuno treatment here, this yes. is chemo for advanced melanoma, could become obsolete. That's right. Well, th one of the new kind of leading edges in medical research has been the idea of instead of chemo, which, to which treats tumor cells with toxic chemicals, radiation, which burns them away, or surgery, which cuts them out, the idea is boost the immune system so that our own body's defenses can actually target cancer. This new drug, it's called Opdivo, actually does that with uh, skin cancer melanoma. It, it, it basically arms the body's immune system to target uh, 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 tumor cells. So what happens with chemo, which is usually the, the frontline treatment for, for melanoma, which is the most deadly form of skin cancer, it does take the skin cancer out, but it also damages healthy tissues and isn't as effective. So a better idea is to, to boost your body's own immune system, and that's what this drug does. It's one in a long line of what I think we're going to see in the next couple of years of new drugs that do try to uh, work on this immunotherapy idea and push that forward. Finally, let's get to this, the health story of the week, our favorite one of the week. Listening to jazz. Yes can improve your golf game. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can only think of this might keep you from having from being that glandular player that I am, throwing clubs, maybe <laughs> just having some easy jazz. Well, what, this, is, this is an interesting one. What they actually did is they took a bunch of golfers out and they had them golf without listening to music, and then they played a variety of different kinds of music, jazz, country, <laughs> rock, hip hop, <laughs> and they found that for some reason people who listen to jazz had a better putting game. Um, the good news is maybe jazz on a little iPod is not going to be a bad, a bad thing for you on the green. The bad news is if you like rock music, it did not improve your game. So, so much for the, uh, the Woodstock generation golfers out there. Isn't this all, though, just about the mental aspect of the game, which so much, it calms you down, it just sure. it puts you in a different space, well, and maybe just disconnects you from the fact that <laughs> you're a rotten golfer. <laughs> could be that. Maybe that's, the, that, but that's kind of the, not the placebo effect, but that's the calming effect of the music, yeah. By the way, I, I do want to point out, a friend of mine told me this many years ago, and this is exactly how I approach my golf game. I would ask him, I would say, what did you shoot? He said, I shot 104. I would say, what is par? He said, 104. Mm -hmm. He said, par is what I shoot. I pay no attention <laughs> to what it is. I go out and shoot, and I'm happy. I that, don't hold myself against That may it. be the best way to approach the golf game, whatever it might be. See that? Okay. Which means we'll go out and play golf one day, and it'll take us, take us years to go out and play, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I'll bring the music. I, I bet you will. All right, Nick, always a pleasure to see you, man. Thanks so right. much for being here. Break, and we return with word on the health of Wall Street today. And some... Rather surprising news about Home Depot when you consider the trouble they've been in recently. That's coming up right here on Midpoint.